Well, as we start a new series tonight in the book of Jude, I anticipate we'll be here maybe five or or six weeks. You can take a really super slow pace through Jude because it's such a rich book, but uh, I think we'll we'll just take that pace. It seems like we can do that and still look at it pretty carefully. So basically, overall, what we're going to do is tonight, verses 1 and 2, what is a Christian? We're going to look at that. Next time, Jude 3 and 4 will be defending the faith, and then we'll go to Jude 5 through 16. That'll be the contradiction of ungodliness. And then after that, it's Jude 17 through 23. There's a call to persevere. And then the the doxology in Jude 24 and 25. Such a short letter, but it really packs a big punch. Um, It was written by a man who was a half-brother of Jesus, It contains the only greeting in the New Testament that doesn't mention grace and the only one that includes love. It was probably written to a congregation of Jewish Christians around 65 to 67 A.D. But of course this is God's word for the church, so it's for all the ages. And um, it's directly applicable, of course, to us. And at the very outset, it kind of asks us to ask ourselves some important questions. How should we think about ourselves as Christians? How should we view our life purpose? What blessings has God bestowed on us? How do they impact the manner in which we view ourselves and our sense of mission? What things ought we to long to be filled with? So this this short letter, it has some striking similarities to 2 Peter. Although I will tell you that that similarity has been somewhat exaggerated and even misinterpreted. It also quotes explicitly from two books that are not part of the Bible. They're non-canonical works. In verse 9, um, evidence indicates that this is an instant of Michael, Archangel Michael, contending with the devil over the body of Moses. Well, that's based on a non-canonical Jewish work called the Assumption of Moses. There's only fragments of that work surviving, but this work uh, expands on the narrative of the burial of Moses in Deuteronomy 34. We'll deal with that verse when we get there. Uh, Then in verse 14, Jude quotes from the non-canonical writing of 1st Enoch, and in doing so, you've got to know he doesn't imply that Enoch was divinely inspired or even that it was written by the biblical Enoch that we have in Genesis 5. Jude was simply using familiar, a familiar source that further confirmed his theme of coming divine judgment. So when we have these references to non-canonical writings, well, that, that shouldn't give us any pause in affirming the inspiration of Scripture and the inerrancy of it, because while allusions to and citations from extra-biblical materials are pretty rare, in the New Testament, that kind of occasional use is not surprising because the New Testament writers are trying to communicate the gospel message in terms that are familiar to the readers. I mean, Peter uses similar apocalyptic literature, Second Peter. Paul uses Jewish tradition um, in Exodus, from Exodus uh, 7, 11, and, and he uses that in Second Timothy 3, 8, where he talks about, he says, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, well, these two men here, Jewish tradition identifies these men as two Egyptian magicians. And then Paul quotes pagan poets in Acts 17, where he says, uh, in him we live and move and have our being, but later in the verse there he says, for we are indeed his offspring, even as some of your poets have said. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 Do not be be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. There's the quote. So the use of this kind of material for illustrative purposes, or it really is a subsidiary appeal to conventional wisdom, implies neither the inspiration of non-canonical works nor even the accuracy of the works contained in them. Now Jude's main concern in this letter was to resist false teachers. And false teachers who had used Christian liberty as, as, and the free grace of God really as a license to sin. Most of this epistle, 
in fact, from verses 4 through 19, is devoted to the condemnation of false teachers in order to impress on the readers to understand just how serious this threat is. So Jude's strategy was also more than one of just negative opposition because he urges his readers to grow in their knowledge of Christian truth. He says in verse 20, Build yourselves up in the most holy faith. He encourages them to bear a firm witness for the truth. Contend for the faith, he says in verse 3. And seek to reclaim those whose faith is wavering. Where he says, snatch others from the fire in verse 23. Well, next week, that's just a brief overview. We'll get into the letter proper. But this week, I want us to simply look at the word of greeting, the salutation found in verses 1 and 2. Now, before we read God's word, let's pray and ask for his help. Lord, you never fail to help and govern those who you are discipling in your steadfast fear and love. Will you keep us, we pray, under your protection, under your good providence. Make us to have an awe and a love of your holy name. And by this means of grace, Lord, the reading and the proclamation of your word, show us yourself, our need for our Savior. Will you open this passage to our understanding? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I invite you to stand for a moment for the reading of these two verses. It begins, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Amen. You may be seated. We ask the Lord to write his eternal truths on all of our hearts. So let's begin by asking, what is a Christian? Uh, how should we think about ourselves as Christians? How should we view our purpose in life? What blessings has God bestowed upon us? And how do they impact the way that we view ourselves and really our sense of mission? Well, surprisingly, in just these two little verses that we have read, Jude goes a long way to giving us an answer to those questions. And I want us to consider these two verses tonight as we zero in for a few moments the identity that we have as Christians, that's the first part. Secondly, the graces that we've received as Christians. And then thirdly, the blessings that we ought to desire as Christians. So the, the identity we have, the grace we've received, and the blessings we ought to desire. So first then, the identity we have as Christians. Stated slightly differently, how, how are we as Christians, how we view ourselves and our Savior? So the first words here in verse 1, we read, Jude, a servant... Well, actually, that word there is really a bondservant or even a slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Now, I know that's simply Jude's self-identification here to the congregation. That's a very standard pattern of the way a letter would be written. You announce who's writing the letter. But I want to suggest to you that in this brief identification of Jude to this congregation, we really have a beautiful picture of his self-understanding as well as his view of Christ. And in, and in that, we have an example for how we as Christians ought to view ourselves and our Savior. Jude's a very common name. Um, it's, it's really, you know, Judah or Judas um, and that we see in the various places in the New Testament. But this man, this man with this very common name, he identifies himself in a remarkable way. I want to suggest to you his identification is remarkable in a couple of ways. First, it's remarkable in what it, tells, what it tells us about himself. And secondly, it's remarkable in what it tells us about Christ. When he says he's a bondservant of Christ, now he's a Christian leader. He's a man of, of some standing. He's the brother of the leader of the church in Jerusalem, James. But he's also a half-brother of Jesus. But he identifies himself in this letter as a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Well, let me ask you something. If you were the half-brother or sister of Jesus, and you were writing to other Christians, wouldn't you tell them? And by the way, hi, I'm Bobby. I'm Jesus' half-brother. Well, this man identifies himself as Jude. And I, by the way, I am Jesus' slave. And I think that tells us a lot about his own self-understanding. It tells us a lot about his humility. He's our Lord's brother. But he views Jesus as his master. It shows his submission to Christ. 
His whole life had been put at the disposal of Jesus. He calls himself the brother of James, even though others call him the brother of the Lord. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9 that James and Jude are brothers of the Lord. But this writer doesn't say, I'm Jude, the brother of our Lord. He says, I'm Jude, the slave of Jesus. I'm the brother of James. I want to suggest to you, he points to the kind of humility and servanthood that every Christian ought to manifest in the very way that he identifies himself here to the congregation. So do we think of ourselves that way? Do we think of ourselves as servants? Do we relate to our fellow believers as servants? This man is a Christian leader, but he calls himself a slave of Jesus Christ. Because the extent of a man's service, really, is the measure of his greatness. This exalted position to which Jude has been called is a position of servanthood. He views his life in terms of serving his master. Because after all, our Lord and Master once adorned himself in the manner of a slave, didn't he? When he washed the disciples' feet. So if we're going to be like Jesus, we're going to be servants. And that's the first remarkable thing about Jude's self-introduction, his self-designation, this emphasis on the fact that he's a servant of Jesus. But you know, even in that phrase, we see some of the the dignity and and the person of Jesus and really the deity of Christ. Are are any of you ready to declare your siblings deity? Can you imagine a man growing up with another man and still acknowledging him as his master? Well, Jude lived with Jesus, and he acknowledged Jesus as his Lord and Master. If that isn't a testimony to the divinity of Christ, then I don't know one. Here Jude acknowledges Jesus as Messiah, the Lord of his life. And yet, even as a servant to Jesus, that sets Jude free. Because it's one of the paradoxes of Christianity, that in glad devotion to Jesus, well, that's where we find our freedom. And so even in Jude's self-designation in the introduction, the salutation of this letter, we learn something about Jude's self-understanding, his view of Christ, and we learn something of what our self-understanding ought to be. We are servants of Jesus Christ. We belong to him. We march to his orders. We follow his word. We are commissioned by him. We seek to go in his ways. We desire to be conformed to his image. We long for his exaltation. We want the nations of the world to come to him. He is the center of our existence in the community of faith. We learn, of course, from Jude's introduction that Jesus is Lord and Master. He's divine. And so we learn something about the way we ought to view ourselves and the way we ought to view our Savior. So first then, our identity as Christians. We're servants of our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. There's a second thing we learned, this little introduction, as well. And you see it in the second half of verse 1. We hear in this portion, we have three divine graces to Christians that impact our purpose in what a Christian is. So point two, what is a Christian? What characterizes a Christian? What favors are given by God to Christians? Well, three Divine factors are specified here. And these three divine graces ought to impact our view of our purpose in life. Jude says, To those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Notice those three things that Jude says about us as Christians. He says, You are the called, you are beloved in God the Father, And you are kept for Jesus Christ. So one by one, when Jude says that you are the called, he's using classic Old Testament language for the people of God. Israel was certainly called by God. Abraham was called by God out of Ur the Chaldees. Remember, he was called out of paganism, out of polytheism, out of his father's land and his people to be the servant of God, to be the friend of God. And in Genesis 12, 1 1 through 3, It is made clear that Abraham was called out of this world, not simply for his own benefit, but for the glory of God and for the good of the nations of the earth. Abraham was not only given blessing by God, but he was called to be a blessing to the nations. He was caught up in a story that was much bigger than his own. He was caught up as a missionary for God. He was caught up as one who would be the father of blessings to the nations. And when Jude calls these Christians called, he's reminding them that they've been called into a story 
which is much bigger than themselves. They've been called not only and given divine blessing, they've been called to be a blessing, and they've been called by God's divine choice and by His grace. Because men never, ever take the initiative toward God. They never approach God until God starts to draw them to Himself. You remember what Jesus said in John 6? No man comes to the Father unless the Father draws him. And so it's not only that they've been effectually called and drawn by God's divine choice and by His election, but they've been called into this grand adventure, an adventure in which we conspire to bless the world with salvific blessings of God in Christ Jesus. So he says to these Christians who are perhaps marginal and persecuted in fear of reprisal from society that has great animosity toward them and suspicion of them. He says, remember who you are. You are the called. You are called to this great mission to bless the world. And I want to remind us here tonight that being called doesn't mean invited. It doesn't mean invited to a party. It doesn't even mean come if you want to. This call is a summons. I've been called. You've been called. You know, a young seminary student walked onto a campus one day. There he, he saw a very respected professor of one of the departments walking along on the campus. And so the professor greeted him because he recognized this young man, put his arm around his shoulder, and he said, Boy, you're going to be my assistant. This professor was pastoring a local church also, and he needed some help. And so he announced to the young seminary student that he was going to be working with them. So the young boy said, Yes, sir. <laughs> He knew it was not an invitation for him to help. It was a summons. It was a command performance. Well, in an even greater way, that is God's call, <coughs> excuse me, on a Christian. It's not an invitation. It's a summons. You've been called, and I've been called to this great work. But not only that, notice we're also beloved in God the Father. We are beloved in the covenant fellowship with the triune God. Now let's celebrate that just for a moment. Because this is the only place in the New Testament where you find this phrase, beloved in God the Father. No other place in the New Testament describes Christians as beloved in God the Father. And Jude's telling us here that as we rest and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation as he's offered in the gospel, we are beloved in God, the Father. We are beloved in union with the Beloved One, Jesus Christ. And we are therefore in God as we are in Christ. In John 7, 26, the last verse of that chapter, now a few verses earlier, John 17, 20 tells us that Jesus prayed this prayer, not only for the disciples who were with him in the upper room, but he prayed it for all believers. In John 17, 20, he says that this prayer is not only for the disciples, but for all who trust in him through their word. Every one of us here tonight trust in Jesus Christ through the word of those faithful disciples. And therefore, Jesus' prayer here is not only for his disciples in the upper room, but it's for you, and it's for me. And in John 17, 26, he tells us that we are co-sharers in the love of of the Father for the Son. As Jesus prays, he says, Lord, grant that the love which we share from before the foundations of the world would be in them. That's a staggering prayer. A staggering words to hear that. Jesus is asking the Father for our, petition, for our participation in that co-eternal love which the Father and the Son have been sharing from before the beginning of time. So dear friends, that prayer has been and it is being answered. It's amazing to, to see how much the Father 
loves us. And if I, and I want to say that if I didn't have John seventeen twenty six, and I would tell you the Father loves us in His Son as He loves His Son, you would accuse me of heresy of saying something like that. But that's precisely what Jude is reminding us of here. We are beloved in God the Father. So we need to revel in that just for a few minutes. In the depth of the Father's love for us in Jesus. That, that's who we are. That's what a Christian is. A Christian is called and a Christian is beloved of God. But notice a Christian is also kept. And Jude celebrates that when he says, Those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be kept for Jesus well, it means that we are kept by God to be presented to Christ for Him. There are two parts of this. There's, there's really perseverance. We like to say preservation. We are preserved. And there is, preserva- there is perseverance for purpose. So we're preserved for something. We're preserved for a purpose. So let's consider that. First, we're kept. Jesus keeps those who trust in Him. Do you remember Him saying... In John's Gospel, no one can snatch you out of my hand. Paul revels in the reality that God causes us to persevere in grace and in faith when he says in 2 Timothy 1.12, For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know that whom I have believed in, and I am convinced that he is able to guard that which I have entrusted to him until that day. So Paul's saying he's confident that he will be kept by the power of God, by the power of Christ. John Calvin once put it this way. He said, at any moment, Satan might snatch us a hundred times over into his ready clutches were we not safe in the protection of Christ. And Jude's asking us to just revel in that for a moment. Satan might snatch you at any time, a hundred times over, into his ready clutches, but, but you are safe in the protection of Christ. You're kept, you're called, you're loved, you're kept. But you're not only kept, you're, you're not only protected, you're not only caused to persevere. Jude wants to say you are kept for Christ. We are kept safe until Jesus' coming. We are kept safe with the view of being God's own possession We're kept safe with a view to being presented to Christ. In Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, Paul tells us something like what Jude is telling us here. As Jude tells us that we are kept for Christ, Paul tells us that truth this way. He says, Christ loved the church and he gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. Jesus keeps the church in order to present the church to himself. And Jude says he keeps us that we might be kept for him. So let's consider this question. Do these three grants of God's favor, do these three blessings of God's grace that we've been called and beloved and we're kept, do these have an overriding influence in our understanding of who we are in Christ and of our mission in the world? The fact that we've been called in this world to be a blessing. uh, That we've been called in this world to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. The fact that we are loved, beloved of the Heavenly Father. And that we are kept safe in Christ for Him. So do we live as if that is true? Because it is. Are there things that we value more than those things? Do we realize the magnitude? Of those graces. Those graces constrain um, gratitude from us. They, they cause us to realize what God has done for us in Christ so that we cannot help but praise Him and thank Him and live for Him. So these divine graces should impact us tremendously. One last thing. Look at verse 2. We see three blessings um, for which Christians ought to long. What a Christian wants. That's point three. What a Christian wants. This is, there's a triple benediction here. This letter hasn't even ended. Much, it hasn't even begun. Much less ended. We had not even got into the stuff of the letter. And already a threefold blessing is being pronounced on us. And I want to suggest to you this blessing says something to us. 
about what true Christians really want because these are the three real blessings that every Christian ought to long for. He says, May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Here Jude speaking of God's mercy to us, his peace to us, and God's love to us. And, and I want to look at each of these for a moment. He says, May mercy be multiplied to you. When mercy is distinguished in the scriptures from grace, mercy is speaking of God's goodness and his kindness and his love toward the needy. Whereas grace, when it is distinguished from mercy, has in view God's goodness and kindness and love toward sinners. And so mercy especially has us in view in terms of our need. And so Jude says, may God's mercy be multiplied to you. When he says that, he is reminding us that we stand in need of God's favor. And that in his grace, he grants that. Every day of our lives, we stand in need of God's mercy. And nothing can meet the needs that we have but the mercy of God. You know, we, we can say that we believe in the sovereignty of God. And we can say that we believe in the power of God. But so often, as Christians, we live as if we could really do it ourselves. But we need to be reminded that there's never a moment when we don't need God's mercy. And in His mercy, there's never a moment when He doesn't grant it. And so Jude says, may mercy be multiplied to you. Not only that, but may God's peace be multiplied to you, he says. God's peace refers to our, our experience of all the blessings which flow from God's objective reconciliation accomplished for us through the atoning death of Christ and his resurrection. It is a rich biblical term, peace. How often do we see it in the Old Testament and in the New Testament in the greeting where, it says, where they say, the writer says, peace I think it is, it is only two, really. It's a, it's a rich biblical term that denotes completeness and soundness and wholeness. It doesn't just mean an absence of enmity with God. It means friendship with God through His gracious covenant. It entails safety and welfare and security and happiness. It's, it's a gift of Christ. You remember Jesus speaking to his disciples in the upper room in John 14, and they're getting ready to go into the worst 72 hours of their lives. And what does he say? Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give to you. So Jesus announces peace, so he tells his disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled, nor, let, nor should you be fearful. This is a tremendous blessing. And we need this peace to serve one another and to serve a world which hates us. And Jude announces, pronounces the blessing of God's love on us as well. He says, may love be multiplied to you. Not our love to God, not our love to neighbor, but God's love to us. The par to parallel this blessing with the other two blessings, it's clear that Jude's drawing attention to God's love toward us. In that sense, he's going right back to the description in verse 1. We are beloved in God the Father. And so we ought to revel in that, delight in that. We also need to ask ourselves this question. Are we desiring these things or are there other blessings that we want more than God and the blessings that he gives? Do we pray for one another like this? Is this the mercy and the love and the blessing of God that we want most for one another in life? Or are there things in this world upon which our hearts are set? Jesus in the Beatitudes and also elsewhere in the Sermon on the Mount, he indicates that there are some people who want the blessings of this life more than they want God and the blessings of the age to come. And he says about them, they just can't have it both ways. He says, you either hate the one and love the other. In other words, Jesus is saying that we must seek, of course, his kingdom first, and then all these things will be added to us. But if we care for other things more than the blessings of God, we won't taste that satisfaction, either in this life or in the life to come. You remember Martin Luther's famous little phrase, it is due to the perversity of men that they seek peace first and then righteousness, and consequently, they find no peace. If we seek the blessings of this life apart from the righteousness of God, which is in Jesus Christ, 
We won't ever really find the real blessing. Solid joys and lasting treasures we will know because those are the things that by God's grace that we've sought above the things of the world. So are we praying for one another to receive these blessings? Are these the things for which we long? May God grant that we would do that by the power of his Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you so much for your mercy and your grace and your love and your peace, the fact that we are beloved in God, we're being kept for Christ Jesus. Lord, we know our hearts are prone to wonder after the things of the world. So will you show us yourself and your blessings and show us our need and then show us our Savior. By the grace of Holy Spirit, we help us to trust in him alone. And in doing that, will you supply all of our needs. And so we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.